This is Barry Jackson. And right on the phone right now, I have somebody who I've long admired uh, from the My Beach New Orchestra, from Shakti. Um, and Rolling, I think in 2003, Rolling Stone regarded this man as, as one of the 100 greatest guitars of all time. <laughs> one in the top 100, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I did a little bit of homework, so. Uh, how considerate of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And, folks, I'm talking with, and I want to welcome to uh, the Midday Medley, uh, Mr. John McLaughlin. Welcome to the well, show. Well, thank you, Barry. What a what a nice uh, entrance you gave me there. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. I see where uh, when you uh, uh, you know you born in born in England and got involved in the music scene. Uh, you played with Brian Auger. Oh what? yeah, oh, that was a, that was a pretty it was pretty nice scene in the '60s in um, uh, in in the UK. You know, because I'm just an old hippie, as you know, Barry. <laughs> And uh, you know, in the swing in '60s and all that, but uh, it was it was very uh, very actually the whole decade, the '60s, musically, uh, socially for that matter, uh, was was really uh, quite uh, pivotal. I think uh, retrospectively, because uh, you know, I mean, as a musician, of course, I went into the '60s listening to Miles, kind of blue, milestones, stuff like that, but within. Uh, just a few years, you know, Coltrane came out with, with Love Supreme, yes. uh, which, I mean, marked me for, for my entire life and marked millions of other people, too. But, you know, then we had this whole, the whole hippie movement started, then the Beatles came, whom I didn't like in the beginning. But uh, after Revolver uh, came out and Sgt. Pepper, and, uh, you know, we were all drop an acid at that time, you know, I realized we're all in the same boat. And, and the records they made um, from that time, uh, I think from Revolver on, uh, I, I, I really, I really liked, I really enjoyed them. And the, the, the music that Miles was doing and, the, and people like Pharaoh Sanders, Archie Shepp, and Cecil Taylor, you know, the, 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 the amount of music and different forms of music that came out of the 60s was, was really quite radical. And as far as the U.K. was concerned, there was this big blues movement. And, uh, and of course, so I was there. I mean, I was playing really mainly R&B that time. Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames, mm -hmm. uh, Herbie Goins and the Night Timers, just really R&B and funk. But since there were only two clubs in the U.K. and London that time, was the, the, the Flamingo Club and, and the, the 100 Club, uh, which was more like blues, and there were two clubs, so we used to meet all the time. And, and in the 100 Club, there'd be, uh, what was his name? John Mayall and the Blues Breakers with Eric. So I met Eric, I mean, 1964, 65. And uh, I remember, like, Mick Jagger was, was, was vocalist for Alexis Corner, with whom I worked. I mean, all the jazz men and the blues men. Really, just there was so much music going on and jamming together, and I think this is one of the reasons why I remember the Rolling Stones. I remember the first audition they made for the Flamingo Club. Boy, were they out of tune! <laughs> but that's their trademark, anyway. So, <laughs> but you know, I mean, there's so there's so much music came out. I mean, Cream came out because the, after Georgie Fame, I was I was I was in a band with. Um, with Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, and Graham Bond, who uh, unfortunately left us. But uh, then Jack and Ginger and Eric, they formed Cream in like 66, 67, something like that. And I was just gigging around with, with, uh, with R&B bands, and I was putting little jazz groups together. You know, and it was, it was a very, very fertile situation. Now, at what stage did you, at what point, what, what year was it you decided to um, make your uh, journey to the United States? Well, in 68, um, I got a call from Tony Williams, um, who I have to say, uh, even today, after all these years, he was one of the greatest drummers of all time, and certainly the latter part of the, 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 the 20th century, he was just the greatest. He was just the greatest. I got a call from him because uh, he'd heard a jam session I'd done with Jack DeJunette and Dave Holland. Uh, actually, Dave was in my band in 68 
I mean, my band, you know, we'd get like one gig every two months, you know, <laughs> and the rest of the time was just R&B. But uh, Dave was playing in Ronnie Scott's club, and Miles walked him and hired him on the spot. Mm. So, so they, I lost my bass player, but, but I mean, as far as the, the British musicians were concerned, we were just like over the moon. I mean, the, you know, the great Miles Davis taking uh, this, a white boy <laughs> from the U.K., <laughs> You know, it was wonderful, and uh, and in the meantime, I'd done this jam with uh, with Jack DeJanet, who recorded it. Uh, I didn't even know we just were jamming in the club together, and he played that for Tony Williams, uh, who called me. It must have been about November, October, November '68, and, and he invited me to come over to the U.S. and form Lifetime with himself and Larry Young. Mm-hmm. The late Larry Young on on uh, Hammond Organ. Right. So right. that was it. I mean, what really happened? Uh, talk about lucky because I arrived in the uh, in New York to play with Tony and Larry, but I met Miles the same day, and the next day he invited me in the studio to do In a Silent Way. So I mm-hmm. mean, talk about being in the right place at the right time. You, um, I, I think, in, in somewhere along the way, though, you got to jam with. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, didn't you, while you were here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was... Uh, well, you know Mitch Mitchell, who was the drummer in the, in the, in the, the experience with no Redding on bass? Because mm-hmm. Jimmy came over to the U.K. because he, he, he couldn't really get things moving in America for himself. He came over to the U.K. and he made this tr- the, the, the experience with Mitch Mitchell, who used to be the drummer with Georgie Fame. So me and Mitch, we went back to like mid to early 60s. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Mitch, actually, he did, he did fantastic things in that, in that trio because Mitch was, he was a great jazz drummer. And he brought, if you listen to, to, to those recordings that Jimmy made with, with the experience, and you hear the way Mitch, Mitchell plays, you hear like Elvin in there, Elvin Jones, you hear Tony, I mean this, but, but it was beautiful what, what he did with Jimmy. And, uh, and of course, he was a big fan of Tony. Mm-hmm. And so in 69, must, uh, must be like very early January, 69, uh, we opened up with, with Tony and Larry and myself at uh, Basie's Bar up in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And then subsequently, uh, we spent a lot of time at the Village Vanguard later that year, and uh, and Mitch. By this time, Jimmy was he, he was big. He was really big. I mean, Woodstock had been in '68, and uh, so he he'd come into town. He'd come right down and see us, Mitch. So the next thing, uh, he he came up uh, the first night. I remember, and he said, "Listen, we're in the Electric Ladyland studio. Why don't you come by and and you know we'll jam." So I went by. I went by with Larry, actually, Larry Young, mm-hmm. and uh, I walked in. I walked in the studio. It was so loud, Barry. I mean, <laughs> unreal. The problem is, is I ha- I was working with this big acoustic guitar, like a hummingbird, you know, with the with the pickup on it. Mm, okay. And um, and I I just I couldn't compete with the volume. Really, it was. Uh, we I mean, we tried it. We 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 jammed. But I should have had a solid body. I would have taken one of his guitars, but I think he was a lefty, wasn't he? It sounded like uh, an experience that I had uh, with a guitarist named Vernon Black trying to play um, Purple Haze, and I play trombone. Uh, what so, kind of guitar were you playing? Oh, I, I played trombone, so you could imagine what it oh, sounded trombone. like. trombone! So you could imagine me trying, <laughs> trying to play the melody. <laughs> you know, over the, over this over this guitar, and this bass, and this drummer. So it was it was fun. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. I get the picture. Anyway, <laughs> no, but I met, I met Jimmy uh, because actually on that session I met uh, Buddy Miles, right? Whom I invited for uh, one of one of the first recordings I did in New York in uh, '69, I think it would be later '69, mm-hmm. and. Uh, because I loved Buddy, he was he was wonderful. What a, what a boogaloo he had! Right. And um, and anyway, in fact, he became uh, with he went with Jimmy with a band of Gypsies, you know. Subsequently, right. right. And uh, so 
I was hanging out with Buddy, and Buddy, I remember, I went down to see Jimmy at, at Madison Square, and you know, we I used to bump into him a couple of times here and there, and he was such a sweet guy, one of the sweetest people you'd ever wish to meet. Mm-hmm. Uh, what a guitar player! No, I mean, I I have got I, I just got to just say a couple of words about Jimmy because, you know, I grew up with uh, listening to jazz music, but. Uh, by the time Miles and Coltrane came along, I, I must have been about 16 when I heard them, and there was no guitar player in that band. Mm-hmm. And, but the music was so radical, and, uh, and I wondered why there was no guitar player in that band. And that kind of like spoiled, the, spoiled me for the bebop thing, you know, because I'd been learning bebop, Charlie Park, and all that prior to that, but when Miles and Train came that really, that really blew my mind, and all I used to listen to was actually Miles and Train. Right. And in the '60s, you know, Coltrane. You listen to something like Intergalactic Space and Coltrane. I mean, you hear him playing notes. He's playing chords almost on mm-hmm. a saxophone. Yeah, it's like distortion. And Jimmy, in a way, for me, he was he was looking at the same thing. He was experimenting with feedback. And, and already by 65, I'd had like a really big amp built because I wanted to get that different sound, the kind of cool bebop guitar sound. That didn't, that didn't sit well because the music was too intense. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but Jimmy really, he, he, he really uh, he put it together. I would say that him and Eric, Eric Clapton, uh, who had himself had a great influence on Jimmy, they really turned the guitar world on its ear. And uh, they both had quite a powerful influence on me because that kind of sound you get with when you're really pushing the amp. You know, and you, the, it's not that the notes are starting to break up, but you've got that little kind of, especially with the tube distortion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and that was, that was where the music was going. That's where Coltrane was taking me. And Miles, who's so intense, that was that... Was that that was uh, that fit right into it. In fact, I'll tell you a little anecdote uh, because having met Miles in, uh, in early January '69, he was uh, he kind of took me under his wing. He was he was really one of the guitar player, and I just uh, I just seemed to fit fit the you know the ideal. And uh, he would invite me over, <clears throat> and one day we were at his house. Uh, and I was telling, telling him about Jimmy, and he told me he'd never seen Jimmy play. And uh, I picked up a copy of The Village Voice, and I saw that there was this Monterey Pop Festival was playing down in the village. And I said, Miles, we're going to go to the movies. You're going to see Jimmy. And I took him down <laughs> to see the Monterey Pop. You know the one where he sets fire to his guitar? Right. And Miles was sitting next to me, and he was just, Damn! <laughs> Damn! <laughs> He he couldn't believe his eyes. I mean, he was he, he was blown away like like everybody. I mean, but Jimmy was radical, man. He was radical. Anyway, that really uh, by the time uh, I started playing with um, with Lifetime, this big acoustic guitar, electric acoustic guitar, didn't last long because Tony wanted that. He was intense, man, and so was Larry Young. The music was going. I don't know where you remember Emergency. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some wild stuff. That's wild. So it, pretty soon, I had to. Uh, I got rid of my uh, my big guitar, and I got a. I got a what was it? A Fender Mustang or something. I didn't have too much money at that time, right. but that was a good guitar. And from there, you know, from Gibson, and then finally, of course, with the Marvish and Orchestra, I ended up with the double neck. Mm-hmm. I, and my, uh, I meant to ask you know you I, you answered part of what I what what my next question was going to be and I just wanted you to kind of describe your relationship with Miles Davis and how did that experience playing with him on Bitches Brew and uh, uh, tribute to Jack Johnson and and the others uh, how did that how did that experience express itself in in your playing and make up what um, my least new John McLaughlin eventually became and 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 yeah. how do you experience you know. With the we have market. to understand, Barry, that, that as I mentioned before, I, I have Miles, I must have been 15 or 16, and, mm. and he, just, like, he, he just blew me away. That Milestones record, it was made in 58. Right. 
uh, you know, with Coltrane, Cannibal Adderley. Mm-hmm. I mean, that record, that was, that was it for me. I said, this is it. This is the music. I mean, forget this bebop, you know, and the, you know, it's, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, with the Tal Fowler, who I've been listening to, Wes Montgomery, these great guitar players, mm-hmm. Jimmy Rainey. But, you know, I mean, that, that music that Miles was playing just really changed my life. So he was my hero, him and Train, Cannonball, that whole gang. They were my heroes, and that was the music. So by the time I got the chance to play with him, I'd grown up the whole of that 60s, those, those amazing quintets he had, first with George Coleman, then with Wayne. I mean, the music he put out, what, a, what an artist. What can I say? So I arrive, and out of the blue, I see Miles. Miles invites me to, to In a Silent Way. I mean, talk about a baptism of fire, Barry. I mean, I was in the studio, and it was, it was In a Silent Way. And that's a Zarinal tune, Joe Zarinal. He was on the date. Mm-hmm. Harvey was on the date. Chick was on the date. And, um, <clears throat> and so he ran the tune down in a silent way. And it had a lot of changes in it. And he didn't like the way, the way it was. So he came up to me and he said, so play it on the guitar. <laughs> you know, and, he, and I, I had a piano part. Because Joe didn't know I was there was a guitar player on the date. I just arrived with Miles, uh-huh. so I had this piano chart. You know, and I've got all these big chords, and I say, "You want you want the chords and the melody? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's going to take me a minute to put all that in guitar." Is that a fact? <laughs> so, he says, "Why don't you play the guitar like you don't know how to play the guitar?" You know, Miles was renowned for these cryptic statements. Right. You know, in the, in the meantime, I'm like, my clothes are soaked, I'm sweating. I mean, <laughs> unreal. I was so nervous. He's my hero, Barry. Mm-hmm. You know, here I am in the studio. So anyway, I figure, okay, I don't know how to play the guitar, but I play E. I know how to play E. I play everything in E. No <laughs> rhythm. I, I, I throw the chords out. I just play the melody. In the meantime, Miles got the light on, the recording light. So I just keep going, and Wayne comes in, and Miles and Wayne came in. And we got to the end, and he loved it so much, the way it came out, that he, I don't know if you remember, on those vinyl records, mm-hmm. he put it on the opening of side one and the end of side one, mm-hmm. the same take. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That far out. Yeah, so uh, here I was, and uh, this, I, I got to tell you, though, the second baptism of fight, because you asked me about Miles, mm-hmm. and the first live concert I did with him, because I used to do concerts with him when I wasn't playing with Tony. And we played, we had a concert in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And <clears throat> so we're on stage, and Miles never said what he was going to play. You, you're supposed to, like, figure it out in the first hundredth of a second. <laughs> so he, he starts playing around midnight. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so he starts playing, and I, and I know the version he's done. So he plays, like, he was just, Chick was in the band, and him and Chick, they were just playing rubato, you know, do 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 di ow, do 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 da, boo di da da, right? And 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 then the, and the recordings that he's done, he does this kind of thing at the end, da 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 da, boom, It's like real like medium swing, okay? And they go into the solos, medium swing. So they get to the end, da da, ding 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 ding, and he's going 150 miles an hour, and he turns around to me and he says, play. <laughs> on round midnight at 150 miles an hour. I mean, I broke a sweat that was <laughs> in, in two seconds. On top of it, this is, this is the old school Barry. Mm. He's, he gets down in front of me on stage in front of the audience. He gets, it's like sitting on his like honkers looking at me while I'm playing a solo, <laughs> right? Just to, uh, just to cool my nerves. I mean, Unreal. Somehow I got through it, you know, and that, and and uh, and the other thing, we came off that set, and we had two sets that night, and I was wet. My my clothes were low. It was just like the recording session, and I'm sitting. And we don't have a dressing room. We're in the university. We're in the gymnasium. So I'm sitting on a bench in the locker room, like you know, ten miles high. And and Miles comes sit next to me, and he says, turns around and says to me. 
oh man, I'm sorry. I didn't. Hmm. You know, and this was like in two seconds one of the greatest lessons of humility I've ever I've ever learned because here's this my hero who just played like a god coming up to me, the new kid in the band, and like you know, not you know, and he's, I'm sorry I didn't play good tonight. You know, I mean, this was this was truly amazing. This was this was a, just an amazing human being. So this guy marked me for life in so many different ways, Barry. Mm -hmm. Musically, of course, but as a human being, how to, how to, in a way, how to run a band, how to, how to get the best out of musicians, you know, without upsetting them. Because, you know, he, he had this way of speaking to his musicians that I didn't want to, I didn't want to emulate that. I didn't want to imitate. I'm, I'm me. I'm Mm -hmm. not Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, for all of us, you know, and uh, and all the guys I speak with, whether it's Chick or Herbie or, or Wayne, I mean, they loved him so much, and they all learned so much from him that, uh, in a way, uh, you know, people like that, I have a debt I'll never be able to repay. Okay, well, now, you, you, uh, at some point, you put together the My Beast New Orchestra, and where mm-hmm. did you find Billy Cobham? Well, Billy, he was on Jack Johnson. Miles found okay. Billy. Miles is the godfather of fusion, believe me, Barry. Yeah. My original orchestra was just, uh, it had a guitar really loud. Actually, we were all really loud. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> I met Billy on that, on that session, on the, on the Jack Johnson session. Because mm-hmm. Miles had been using for a couple of dates. You know, some of the dates, they never came out. I mean, they did, like, many, many years later. But sometimes we do dates that, that we'd never see released. And I met Billy on one of those, and we got really tight uh, on just hanging out, you know. And and one day, this must be 19, end of 19, around October, November 1970, um, uh, I had the idea for the band, and I, and I called Billy right away because I loved the way he played. I loved the way he played. He, he's just outstanding. And uh, and Billy was up for it, and I told him, I said, "Listen, I'm, I'm going for, a, I'm looking for, a, I don't want a jazz violin player. I want a, I want a rock violin. I want a blues violin player." And uh, it took me a while to find Jerry Goodman, but he was uh, he was playing with a band out of Chicago called the Flock. You remember that band? Um, vaguely. No, okay. Anyway, but uh, Billy and I, we were we were really tight. In fact, even before. I, I found Jerry, me and Billy started like rehearsing, going through some of the music, just the two of us. And uh, what, what a pleasure, man. What a, what a beautiful drummer. Okay, um, now you went through how many incarnations of the group? You could go through one, one incarnation or two incarnations of Mob Beast New Orchestra. Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's really kind of a sad story because, uh, you know, I think we, we had maybe too much commercial success. Because it's one thing to have artistic success, Barry, but we had a lot of commercial success. And um, maybe too quickly, because uh, uh, you know Jan Hammer. Right. Jan, I found Jan, he was, he was playing with Sarah Vaughan at the time. Mm-hmm. Great musician, great mm-hmm. piano player. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we've been together for 18 months i mean we were just like like a, a rocket going up you know mm-hmm. and uh, going everywhere playing everywhere maybe playing too much because you know people got a little a uh, little leery and and jan and jerry kind of got this little clique going and and uh, you know and at one point after i'd done this tour with with santana we did the love devotion surrender tour right in 72 and uh we we ended up in hawaii and i picked up the rest of the band billy was with me in on the on on the on the santana tour Uh, and and me and billy we we waited for the rest of the band to to, uh meet in hawaii to go tour japan and at that point uh something has happened i don't know I, i still don't know to this day Jan and Jerry, uh, they got a little strange with me, and they wouldn't speak to me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, 
So after a while, I said, you know, hey, I mean, you want to play? That's like speaking. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to play, we're going to speak. But uh, in the end, they didn't. And, and I said, well, listen, I don't, want, I don't want to live like this. You know, I, I, I want to be tight with the guys. You know, I don't want any animosity with the music. And so uh, we ended up, we finished off about six months of contracts, and, uh, and that was it. So and then I came together with Jean-Luc Ponty, Nard and Michael Walden, Ralph Armstrong. That was some band. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big band for a while. And then we did, we did that recording with the London Symphony Orchestra. Right. And then we toured with that large group, about ten pieces. And, uh, but over the next couple of years, it kind of like, you know, uh, it came down to a quartet because I wanted to play more, um, I, I wanted the music less structured, more open, you know, a little more spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And, um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, I started studying Indian music. I mean, I started studying Indian philosophy. Right already in the late 60s, mid-60s to late 60s. And uh, I started studying Indian music theory um, in, in 1970. And uh, I became a student of a, a, a Vienna teacher in, in Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And through him, I met uh, El Shankar, the violin player. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I met Zaki Hussein, who uh, even today he's uh, he, he is with me in the in the Remember Shakti. We are the only two original members, yeah. but th the music we started to play together in 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, so Shakti was already in existence, even parallel to the like the Mahavishnu Orchestra, the second version, and. Uh, Eventually, Shakti took over. By 1976, uh, uh, Shakti moved uh, moved into the first position. Mm -hmm. But 1984, I made the final edition of the Mahavishnu. Actually, it was the, the recording was called Mahavishnu. It was a kind of a homage to that whole era mm -hmm. with um, Bill Evans, sax player. Right. What a what a great player he is. I just jammed with him recently. Mm. With him and Randy Brecker, and, uh, we were in Montreal together. Um, Mitch Foreman, uh, Billy did the recording on that, uh -huh. uh, but he, he missed the tour, and I ended up getting Danny Gottlieb, wonderful drummer. Right. But uh, I missed Billy on that. Uh, and really, that was it, because after that, um, I kind of like took a few years out with with uh, with the guitar trio with Paco de Lucia and first of all it was Larry Corio right and then subsequently with Aldi Miola and right. we did a lot of touring with that trio yeah I but saw but really that. there was three versions of of my Vishnu but the the third one was really just a kind of uh, you know I wanted to take my hat off to that memory hmm. which I still do in fact I was doing it today. I was thinking about one one particular piece that we did in those those years ago. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, let me see. I guess the thing that I and because I remember seeing a video of you and Paco and uh, I believe it was Larry Coriel, the the, the guitar. Oh trio. yeah, there's, there's a DVD out. The pirate DVD came out. I don't know. Gee, twenty eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, and we never ever got paid. Really? Yeah, and they sold millions. I well, they sold hundreds of thousands. No, but this, no, I mean, just you know, there's a lot of unscrupulous people, mm -hmm. and well, not a lot, but there are there are a number of unscrupulous people in the music business. It's not the first time I've been screwed royally, yeah. Yeah. but uh, you know. I don't know too many musicians who haven't been rolled, you know, right. Barry. It's yeah. kind of kind of goes with the job, unfortunately. Um, and you, uh, you made a, a, a an appearance in the movie Round Midnight. Oh, that was Dexter? great. That was that was great yeah. with Herbie and Dexter. Right. Dexter Gordon and uh, oh, Billy Higgins playing drums, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pierre Michelot. And um, that was really, that was special. 
because in fact it was uh, the the guy who made the, who made the movie was a French director called uh, Bernard Tavernier, who was a great d- director actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you know French movies, I grew up with French movies. I grew up with French people okay. in the French language, which is one of the reasons why I'm comfortable here. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, that movie, Bertrand Tavernier, he was he really loved. Uh, Lester Young, mm-hmm. but Lester Young didn't have the life that Bud Powell had. And Bud Powell, he he's the one who moved to Paris, and and the life story is based in a way on on Bud Powell's uh, life story in Paris. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. you know, uh, he uh, Bertrand Tavernier he wanted a sax player and not a pianist. Which I thought was a good idea. Anyway, it's just a movie. Right. So he got Dexter in, and Dexter was something else. Yeah. I mean, that was great because you know we were in the on the on the movie set. I mean, it was live. We we were we were recorded live. Hmm. I mean, you know, we were playing. There was no playback. But I mean, with Harvey, Billy Higgins, Dexter, come on. I mean, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> But you know, with a zoot suit on, and everything. I hear you. That was that was that was a great experience. Uh, we were a little we were a little worried about Dexter, although he was he he was making us pee in our pants. What a what a comedian! He was so funny, but he was not well at that time, which kind of suited the film because in the in the movie he was supposed to be a little sick, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With the drugs and everything. Right. But in fact, uh, you know, we'd be looking at Dexter sometimes uh, because, this, you know, it's it's long hours on the movie set. Yeah. You know, it's like the director comes and say, okay, we're up. You know, you, you've been waiting three hours to play and so in your suit. So you, you get on the stage you know, we, and we start playing. We're getting in the middle of the song, stop! Lights <laughs> all wrong, you know. <laughs> so you take an hour break, and you know, and you come back. Okay, play. You know, it's it's hard. I think it was hard for Dexter, but he did it like a real champion. Yeah. He had us in stitches, Barry. <laughs> that was that was that's a real document. I'm glad that Tavernier did that because you get to see Dexter, and like as he is, you know, he was just playing himself, really. Picking him up from the airport, he did that to me several years ago. I'm sorry? Picking him up from the airport for a performance here in Kansas City, he did that to me. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, my, uh, I want to move a little forward to let me talk about the, uh, the group Fourth Dimension and Five Piece Band. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, with. that was, that was, I just finished just a couple of months back. Right. With Chick and, uh, well, we had, uh, you know, Christian McBride on bass, right. and um, Kenny. Kenny Garrett, yeah. uh, another alumni from Miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we traded a few stories. <laughs> and uh, But what a beautiful band. And we had Vinny Colaiuta in the beginning, right. the, first, uh, the first leg of the tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, when we moved to the U.S. part, we had Brian Blade. Who was just outstanding? What a what a great drummer! What a human being too. Now the recording, but, the recording uh, for Five Piece Band that was done. Where was that done? That was done in Europe. Okay. And we had Vinny with us on that. Right. We actually wanted to do. They wanted to do a video of the band, you know, with Brian, uh-huh. some, somewhere in America. Yeah. But you know, I mean, the, you know how many DVD music DVDs. You can sell these days about fourteen. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't even talk about CD sales. I mean, because it's, it's lamentable, really. You mm-hmm. know, we, if we had to live on record sales, we'd be dead. Right. Uh, and so, I mean, that just nobody wanted to put up the money because to make a DVD, you gotta, you know, it's gotta be like seventy, eighty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You gotta have all the cameras, and you gotta have the. The, the post production and you know, the mixing and uh, you know and, and it's endless and, and who's going to get their money back? Nobody. Right. Right. So uh, that that idea was shelved, unfortunately. Too bad. D- but we got the CDs at least, and that I think you know that's that's a real document because with Chicken, Chicken me, I've been a fan of Chicks since '67. Uh, 
I go back, Barry, okay? Mm, okay, all right. <laughs> and in 67, I had a record of Chick. I, I didn't know it was him. I, I had a record of Montego Joe. He had this kind of Latin jazz, mm -hmm. beautiful percussionist. And on piano, I listen to the head of the piano player. I say, dang, man, who is this piano player? And I look on, on the back of the record, Chick Corea. Who is he? Who is Chick Corea? He was killing. And I, say, I, was, I, I was telling my musician buddy, I say, listen, this guy, this guy's going to be with Miles. I, I, I know it. I just know it. And in 68, he was with Miles. Yeah. So by the time I arrived in New York in January 69, of course, Chick was there. And we became real tight mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we were neighbors. He was on 19th Street. I was on 22nd Street. <laughs> and we used to hang out a lot. We used to talk about philosophy a lot. We used to talk about, you know, you know the meaning of existence, all that, all that hippie stuff, uh, Barry. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, hey, man. That's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm still a hippie today. And, uh, and we used to have these white nights talking about this and that and, you know, and the meaning of it all. And he was going on the Scientology way, and I was going on the, the yoga way. Right. And, and I'm saying, no, you got to come and see this. you got to come and see. Actually, I was in the Sufis at that time, uh -huh. which is the esoteric side of Islam. Which right. Is really, really beautiful, I have to say. I know Islam in America and in, around the world does not have a good reputation at the moment. But it's really too bad because, because it's, it's the beautiful side like this beautiful side to all religions. Well, I, it, it, and, and that's, that's mainly due, I mean, when, when people don't really know what, and especially after you mentioned the Sufism, I mean, uh, that's something I'm yours truly is familiar with. So uh, Yeah, I know. mean, it's, anyway, and I was saying, you got to come and see this guy, Peter Vilayat Khan. You know, he's the greatest exponent of, of, of this side of Islam, which is so beautiful. He said, no, man, you got to come and see L. Ron Hubbard, man, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew L. Ron Hubbard because he was a science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. Well, he used to be anyway. But and then in, in the end, we agreed to differ, and I went my way, and he went his way. But we had this musical kind of thing happening because over the years, we, we played many, many times together. But in a way, most of the time in Europe, very rarely we've had jam sessions in America. I don't know why. Maybe it's because there's so many festivals in Europe in the summer. Mm. Anyway, you know, and we stayed in touch over the years. He sends me his records. I send him my records. And we, we, we just call each other up. We chat. We write. You know, and we just... Because he's a beautiful man. Mm. And he's a beautiful musician. So finally, actually, he had the idea of putting five-piece band together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 19... Uh, uh, no, in 2000 and... Uh, six right and uh he called me up and he said listen we got to do it he'd been bugging me for 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 a couple of years hey come on let's let's do, let's do something together i said yeah i'm really busy i got this i got that I'm, I'm. he said yeah but you know you got to make time and finally he called me one day he said listen i got kenny i said oh kenny he said i got christian oh <laughs> damn you know, so at that point I said, "All right, let's go for it." You know, uh -huh. and I said, uh, "I get, I got the name," and 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 we went from there. It took a while to put together, but it was just an outstanding experience to be playing with these musicians. Christian McBride is one of the greatest human beings. Kenny too, mm -hmm. Brian Blade, and, and Vinny. I mean, just beautiful human beings and just outstanding players. Yeah. So I mean. We just had a wonderful time together, a well, wonderful time, Barry. Well, tell me this. What do you have set up? What do you have uh, looking forward to in the near future? Well, you know, I mean, before we, I went out with Five Piece Band, I've got the, 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 the fourth dimension. I don't know if, do you have a copy of that DVD? I don't have a copy it, of the, the uh, not at this time, but uh, it'll be forthcoming uh, here, here to the well, KKFI listen, studios. Well, listen, our distributor is in, is in Cary, uh, North Carolina. He could send you a copy. Okay. I couldn't send you a copy because I have pal, but he could send you an NTSC copy, man. You got to see. This was a concert done last year in Belgrade, four-piece band. It's really good. This is like no edit, just direct to tape. You know, video and audio. 
Okay, okay. But I'll need your address, Barry. Okay. Can you send me an email with your postal address? I I certainly will. Listen, it has been a pleasure and an honor to just sit back and sit back and listen to somebody. I hope I get to meet you one of these days, Barry. Well, we're gonna have to try to get you here to town, or you let me know when you're somewhere close. That's what you have to do. But don't forget, send me your address. I'll have that DVD. You got to check out the DVD. It's really good. Well, it's been a pleasure. And, yeah, uh, me too, Barry. I'll get Real that. E- I'll get that email to you. Okay, man. All right, take I'll care. I hope I see you soon. All right, then. You take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. Like I